This is the BBC. For details of our complete range of programmes, go to bbcworldservice.com forward slash podcasts. Welcome to the latest global news compiled in the early hours of Friday the 5th of January. I'm Alex Ritson with a selection of highlights from across BBC World Service News today. Coming up, President Trump tries to block the book that accuses his family of treason. But how did the author get his information? He was given a badge going into the White House, which is not a normal press badge. It's a different type of badge where it just allowed him to walk around the West Wing. Several people are dead and hundreds injured in a train crash in South Africa. There was people screaming, people shouting, the smoke everywhere, smoke flames everywhere, people running in different ways. And the Swiss diplomat who rescued thousands of Jews from the Nazis, another side to the country's role in the Second World War. But first, it claims President Trump's family had treasonous meetings with Russian lawyers, that Donald Trump was angry at celebrities snubbing his inauguration, and that his daughter, Ivanka, hopes to be president. Now, the explosive book Fire and Fury by the journalist Michael Wolfe holds the number one spot on Amazon's bestseller list, even before it's officially released. Donald Trump's lawyers are urgently trying to stop the publication of the book, which is supposedly based on 200 interviews, including with former top aide Steve Bannon. President Trump was asked about his relationship with Mr. Bannon. I don't know, he called me a great man last night, so, you know, he obviously changed his tune pretty quick. All right, thank you all very much. Thank you. I don't talk to him. I don't talk to him. I don't talk to him. That's just a misnomer. Thank you. Many people are questioning how Mr. Wolf had such access at the White House. Daniel Lipman is a reporter for the Politico website in Washington. He's long been a friend of Trump from the New York media circle days, and he was given a badge going into the White House, which is not a normal press badge. It's a different type of badge where it just allowed him to walk around the West Wing. I remember when I was at the White House, I got lost in the West Wing, and the deputy press secretary came up to me and said, what, what are you doing in my office? But it seems like Michael Wolff was able to just run around and collect little tidbits for his book. And this is a respected journalist. This is not a fake news person that they might want to label. I asked the BBC's Anthony Zerka in Washington about the state of the legal proceedings. Well, right now it's a cease and desist letter. So it's uh, a threat of legal action and not a lawsuit per se. It's saying that the publisher and Mr. Wolf uh, engaged in actual malice, that it's possibly libelous, defaming the president, uh, and that they're calling for all distribution of the book and excerpts from, from CSIM. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that the publisher and Mr. Wolf are not going to abide by this letter. Uh, and if we'll remember in the past, sometimes Donald Trump, even when he was a private citizen, would threaten lawsuits, but then very seldom follows through. So I think this represents, if nothing else, an escalation in the rhetorical war against uh, Mr. Wolf and his book. Any news from Steve Bannon? Uh, well, we heard from him last night on an interview on Breitbart Radio, and he said that he views Donald Trump still as a great man and supports him. He didn't directly address any of the quotations ascribed to him in this book, which was interesting. In fact, he didn't really talk about it much. But uh, in comments today, Donald Trump noted that Bannon had called him a great man and said he seems to be changing his tune. There are some extraordinary claims in this book. Is there any evidence for them? Can Mr. Wolf validate them? Well, he says, uh, he, as you mentioned, he talked to over 200 people in and around the White House and that he has tapes of these conversations. So conceivably, he could come out with some of the transcripts of his communications. There have been several White House former staffers who have said that they were misquoted, and so this could straighten some of that up. But it, it appears pretty certain that Wolf had access to the White House for an extended period of time. His reporting matches what was out there in a lot of the press, although it goes a little beyond that. And for him, to discuss some senior White House people questioning Donald Trump's capability of being president. And that was some of the more explosive portions of this book. For someone trying to sell a book, this is 
the most extraordinary advertising campaign you could have, isn't it? No doubt. There's that, uh, that internet meme, the Streisand effect, where Barbara Streisand tried to block a website from reporting photos of her home, and all that did was attract further attention to the photographs. I think you're seeing the same thing here. The more Donald Trump attempts to squash this, the more they can market this as the book that Donald Trump doesn't want you to read. I mean, it's already jumped up to number one on the Amazon bestsellers list. I think there's no doubt this book is going to get huge publicity. Anthony Zerker. So how common is such a high-profile split at the top of Washington politics? And what do the Republicans make of this very public drama? John Gizzi is the veteran Republican watcher and the White House correspondent for the conservative news website Newsmax. Remember, this is Washington inside baseball. The fact is that Donald Trump is president. Who got him elected? or who strategized and played a big part in his election is really not that important anymore, especially when one considers this is someone who lasted seven months in the West Wing of the White House. I would say that people are going to pay attention to Steve Bannon for a while. They're going to listen to his rants. They'll talk about it, and then they'll move on to other things, such as the developments in Iran and Russia. Uh, if you stay in this business long enough or read history, you find these things happen over and over again. John Gizzi. Brazil has long prided itself on being a rainbow nation, a melting pot of heritage with Brazilians descending from African, European, indigenous and other peoples. Supposedly, it's a nation where racism doesn't exist. But the introduction of race quotas for entry to the country's top universities perhaps challenges that idea. David Baker sent this report from Brazil. The students here are very strong, more than when I first came here, says psychology student Jessica. Here in Brazil, we have five skin colors in our system. And if you put black or mixed race, you get quota rights. So I take to say I'm black. It was the first time ever that I found it an advantage to be black. Jessica's university, the University of Rio Grande do Sul in the south of Brazil, began its quotas 10 years ago. But since 2016, all federal universities must comply with a law setting aside places for black, mixed race or indigenous students. It's been bitterly controversial. The university's rector, Rui Vincenti Opperman, says that when it was first proposed here, there were violent protests. We had to ask for the police to be here. We had a corridor of people hitting us. They were yelling, some of them were pushing us. They were saying, you're destroying the university. In fact, studies have now suggested so-called cotistas don't perform any worse than other students over time. They're often highly motivated and catch up fast. But there is another issue that's proving more difficult to overcome. There is a sense here that the country is a rainbow nation where racial difference doesn't exist. The creation of racial quotas challenges that. Almost everyone in Brazil can claim some sort of mixed ancestry. But that led to many white students claiming to be mixed race or even black. Cue a spate of high-profile expulsions. And now the rollout of controversial race scrutiny committees to decide if a student is black enough to get in. Rosemary Gomez Lemos is a member of one such panel at the University of Pelotas near the Uruguayan border. I show her a photograph of a candidate on my iPhone, and she's frank about how the verification process works. What is it that you see in this photo that makes you so certain this man is black? Cabelo. His hair? Nariz. Nose. Like the Nazis is how some see this kind of evaluation. But surprisingly, many black community groups disagree, pointing out that it's not the person whose grandmother was mixed race who suffers racism in Brazil. It's a person with typically black hair, nose and mouth, as well as skin colour. And these can be judged from appearance. In any case, it seems the controversy is unlikely to dislodge the quota system itself. Brazil has come too far now to go back on them, realising that it's not the colourblind society it thought it was, and trying, however falteringly, to put that right. David Baker. 
Nigeria has sent athletes to compete in every summer Olympic Games since 1952, but so far no Nigerian has competed in the Winter Olympic Games. But this might change at this year's Games to be held in Pyeongchang in South Korea in February. A team of three is on its way to qualifying for the women's bobsleigh event, and they're currently training hard. Julian Marshall spoke to their driver, Sean Adigan, who lives in the U.S., but is of Nigerian parentage. I was a member of the U.S. team, and while I was there, I learned that the sport was trying to grow, and they wanted more women's teams, as well as the country of Nigeria was looking for their first Olympians, Winter Olympians, and they didn't have any people for 2014. So when I learned that Africa as a continent had never been represented in the sport of bobsled at the uh, Winter Games, I said, okay, this has obviously grown to be much larger than me. So I went ahead and got with the Nigerian Olympic Committee, first vice president um, named Chief Solomon Ogba, and we talked about it, and that's how we got it started. And for those who are not familiar with the sport, describe what's involved. Oh, my goodness. You know, most people don't realize that it's, bobsled is actually like a hard labor sport. You have to flip this 325-pound sled all over the place. You know, you're flipping it up and down. You're loading it on a truck. You're taking it up a mountain. Then uh, once you get it up the mountain where the start line is, you take it off, you flip it over, you have to put these runners on the bottom, which are what the sled actually slides on. Once you've gotten that, then you finally eventually take it off, put it on the bobsled line. And once you've flipped it, two people, um, for women, um, there'll be a driver in the front and a brakeman in the back. We both hit the sled at the same time, which is basically the action of getting it from um, zero to initial velocity. And then we jump in. The brakemen in the back, once they jump in, they put their head all the way down in the bottom of the sled for aerodynamics. And then I, as the driver, I sit up and I navigate us safely down the track. At what sort of speeds? Um, sometimes around like 80 or 90 miles an hour. I think I've actually hit about uh, one time I hit about 143 kilometers per hour. And how do you rate your chances should you make it to the Olympics? Um, you know, I think that the Olympic Games is one of those venues where you never count anyone out. You know, um, people knock themselves out. People arise to the occasion. Um, so really, I think that with respect to the sport, obviously, there are a lot of amazing drivers out there, but I'm going to be just as competitive as the next woman, you know. It, everyone is going to be fighting for pretty much the same three spots, and I think I'm going to count myself in there. And how aware are people in Nigeria that uh, they might be represented at the Winter Olympics? I think at this point, most people are extremely aware. You know, they are actually the most excited, I would say, about the idea of being the first country to represent Africa um, at the Winter Olympics in the sport. So I think that majority of the country is already hooting and hollering for the team that they're going to have at the Olympic Games. Now, you can't be unaware of uh, cool runnings. Um, would, you ex <laughs> would you expect a movie to be made out of your um, venture? <laughs> You know, I wouldn't be opposed to it if it happens, but, um, you know, I think that if they do, it'd be really cool. You know, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> so you feel as if you're living in a bit of a movie. Oh, yeah, for sure. I don't know that I could have dreamt up this process. I mean, it seems like every day is a new adventure. Sean Adigan speaking to Julian Marshall. You're listening to Global News, the most important stories and the best interviews and on-the-spot reporting from the BBC World Service. Every weekend you can hear a review of the week's main news stories and why they matter. That's in The World This Week and the programme is also available to download from our website www.bbc.co.uk forward slash programmes. Still to come in this podcast, panic buying of a fizzy drink in Scotland. We're all responsible adults, so we should be for buying that. We, we should have the choice as to what we put in our bodies, you know what I mean? I know that it's not going to be the same product. But first, as we record this podcast, officials in South Africa say at least 18 people have been killed in a train crash about 200 kilometres southwest of Johannesburg. Some 270 people were injured when the train hit a truck at a level crossing. One of the survivors, Tian Esterhazen, 
told the BBC that he tried to help fellow passengers who were trapped, but was unable to save them when their carriage caught fire. A few other passengers were shouting that there's still passengers stuck inside. So we climbed over one of the trucks. We found ourselves next to three other ladies that was physically stuck in a train. And they were shouting at us, listen, uh, the baby, the baby. Uh, we tried, tried to look for the baby, couldn't find it. We break down the windows to look through it. And then I think it was basically about seven to ten minutes, that same truck where they were in, the train truck, was full of flames, so they didn't make it. The South African Minister of Transport, Joe Maswanganyi, blamed the truck driver. As a result of the truck that was driving through a level crossing, carrying almost two trailers or two carriages, and you can see for yourself that the truck driver was taking chances. He thought that he was going to pass through. Literally did he know that the, the train was going to hit him. That has costed lots of lives. The South African Minister of Transport, Joe Maswan Ganyi, speaking about that train crash in South Africa. Every year, a different country chairs the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, and this year, it's the turn of Switzerland. The Swiss, famous for their neutrality, though, have often been criticised for their actions during the Second World War, storing Nazi gold, for instance, and turning Jewish refugees away from their border, for which Switzerland only apologised relatively recently. But there are other stories as well about Switzerland's role in the war, and the country's chair of the Holocaust Alliance has given historians a chance to research them. Here's the BBC's Imogen Folks in Bern. Plain. In a small office in Bern, two women, one a historian, the other a survivor of the Second World War, are combing through documents. Here, look here, it's a big family. All related to one Swiss man, long dead and virtually unknown in his own country, Karl Lutz. Nobody hardly knows anything about him. Actually, the way I came across his story was in Budapest when I attended a Holocaust conference. And I was walking in the Jewish quarter of Budapest and I literally stumbled across the monument. I looked at it and, and thought, who is this Karl Lutz? <gasps> He's Swiss! Historian Charlotte Tallier is researching Karl Lutz, neutral Switzerland's vice consul in Hungary, from 1942 to 1945. Well, this is a collective nice. passport. The documents are protective letters issued by Lutz to Budapest's Jews. After the German occupation of Budapest, Hungarian Jewry in the countryside was in very quick succession deported to Auschwitz. So he realized he needed to act very quickly. He issued protective letters, as this one, for example. As the Nazis tightened their grip, Lutz came up with a plan. The Swiss consulate had 8,000 permits for immigration to Palestine. He issued a letter of diplomatic protection for each, applying them not to individuals, but to entire Jewish families. When he reached 7,999, he started at one again, hoping the Nazis wouldn't notice. When the Nazis began shooting Jews on the banks of the Danube, Karl Lutz set up 76 safe houses across the city. As the Soviet army approached, the fighting became intense and the cellar of the Swiss consulate became a safe house too. Agnes Hirschi was there. I celebrated my seventh birthday at the end of the war in the cellar and Karl Lutz was a very nice man. He, he still had some chocolate for me. Agnes went into the cellar in December 1944. She came out in February 1945. But she, her mother and many others had survived. Charlotte Tallier estimates that Karl Lutz's actions saved over 60,000 lives. Because of that letter they had safety, they had a safe space. So it is the largest civilian rescue operation during this, uh, the Second World War. He did a great act of civil disobedience. He said, you know, there is a great injustice happening and I cannot remain neutral. But back in neutral Switzerland, Karl Lutz was not rewarded but reprimanded for exceeding his authority. Interviewed shortly before his death in 1975, 
he remembered his disappointment. No one thanked me. They just told me I was lucky to survive the war. No government minister even shook my hand. One said to me, you didn't have any orders to carry out this rescue. Why was Switzerland so churlish? One reason, celebrating Lutz's actions, however heroic, did not fit Switzerland's policy of strict neutrality. Finally, says Charlotte Tallier, there is the character of Lutz himself. Karl Lutz was a very shy, modest, pious man. He wasn't Superman. He, he wasn't an action hero. He was a bureaucrat. And as such, he was quintessentially Swiss. Charlotte Tallier ending that report by Imogen Folks. A suicide bomber has blown himself up near a crowd of police and protesters in Afghanistan's capital, killing at least 15 people. It's the latest violence to hit Kabul. The explosion appears to be a determined attack on the country's security forces. Azir Shah Raya reports from Kabul. Witnesses say the blast was huge and it could be heard from a long way. It's thought the explosion coincided with the protest against the police who were trying to close down some shops as part of their campaign against drug dealings. The blast happened a week after another deadly attack on a cultural center in the west of Kabul that killed more than 50 people. ISIS said it carried out that attack. Yesterday, the Afghan intelligence department announced it had arrested 15 ISIS coordinators in Kabul. Zia Shahreya. This week, our correspondent Steve Rosenberg has been reporting from some of the Russian cities that will be hosting the 2018 World Cup from Tatarstan to Volgograd and looking at what the venues will offer fans, apart from the football, of course. Now our correspondent Sarah Rainsford takes up the baton to finish the tour of the 11 cities, travelling from Sochi in the south to Kaliningrad in the west. doesn't really feel like it in the pouring rain like today but Sochi here on the Black Sea coast is Russia's top resort town and I'm standing now on a pebble beach with the waves crashing onto the shore I'm pretty sure that come the summer these beaches will be lined with football fans I'm gliding now in a cable car through the mountains of Sochi this is where some of the key venues were for the 2014 Winter Olympics but come June, this is a fantastic place to come for the view. At the local aquarium here, Harry the Otter has got quite a reputation for predicting sports results. He had a 75% success rate at the Olympics here. Just being chomping a big chunk of fish and uh, having a bit of a swim. But I've got two skittles and I'm going to ask Harry a question. Is England going to win the World Cup. Green for yes and red for no. His keeper here, Olga, is about to throw the skittles into the water. So let's see what happens. Uh oh, and he's going, oh, straight for the green. It took seconds and he's decided, no doubt about it, England to win. There are some spots here in Kaliningrad where you look around and you think you could be in Europe. I'm standing next to a huge red brick German style cathedral with a big spire. There's plenty of pretty brutal Soviet architecture here too though. And that's because this is now Russian territory. It's a sliver of the former Soviet Union that today is cut off from Moscow and surrounded by the EU. And this peculiar hybrid place is now the westernmost venue for the World Cup. just crossed the river onto a massive construction site. Huge orange cranes around it and trucks carrying sand and gravel trundling past. This whole area was a swamp just a couple of years ago. It's now being converted into a key World Cup site. Kaliningrad is set on the Baltic coast and there is beautiful sandy beach the pine trees stretching away into the distance. Now, after a storm, sometimes the waves here can throw up chunks of amber onto the beach. That precious stone is worth a small fortune, so perhaps a bonus 
for some football fans, or maybe a consolation prize. That report by Sarah Rainsford. Fans of the Scottish soft drink Iron Brew have begun stockpiling cans and bottles ahead of a change to its recipe. The company that makes Iron Brew is changing the formula to get rid of its high sugar content, but more than 10,000 people have signed a petition against the move. With more, here's Richard Hamilton. Everybody in the world loves Iron Brew. I do, I do, I do. Me too. Everybody in the world loves Iron Brew. A controversial television advert for Iron Brew from 2004. We love Iron Brew, even though I used to be a man. Even though I used to be a man! Since it was first introduced in 1901, Iron Brew, like whiskey, haggis and deep-fried Mars bars, has come to epitomise what it means to be Scottish. It's also been the go-to cure for a hangover. The makers of Iron Brew, A.G. Barr, have kept its recipe secret in a safe in Switzerland. The original can contains 140 calories. That's the equivalent of eight and a half teaspoons of sugar. But with the introduction of a government sugar tax on soft drinks due in April, the company has decided to stop making the old version and cut the sugar content in half. Ryan Allen has 24 bottles stockpiled in his attic and started an online petition called Hands Off Our Iron Brew. He spoke to the BBC's Kay Adams. We're all responsible adults, so we should be for, for buying that. We, we should have the choice as to, as to what we put in our bodies, you know what I mean? I know that it's not going to be the same product when they add the, the sweeteners into it. But if any of the listeners out there drink Lucozade, they'll know that it's changed in the last maybe six months and it's just, it's, it's not the same. It's not the same drink you're getting. It might taste better. I don't think so, no. No? Do you think you get used to it? No, well, I, wouldn't, I don't really want to get, to get used to it, to be honest. But nutritionists say sugary soft drinks are dangerously attractive to children, rot their teeth and have contributed towards a national obesity epidemic. A.G. Barr has acknowledged that cultural changes needed to be made in Scotland and said that in surveys, nine out of ten drinkers loved the taste of the new iron brew. And in blind tastings, it said most could not tell the difference. Richard Hamilton, who somehow always manages to get deployed onto the story that you're going to remember. And that's all from us for now, but an updated version of the Global News podcast will be available for you to download later. If you want to comment on this podcast or the topics covered in it, you can send us an email. The address is globalpodcast at bbc.co.uk. I'm Alex Ritson. Until next time, goodbye.